If you want the latest info, tips, and strategies to grow your online course or membership, check out the Thought Leaders Business Lab podcast. And now here's your host, Jeff Aiken. Welcome to the Starfleet Leadership Academy, a leadership development podcast told through the lens of Star Trek. And now here's your host, Jeff Aiken. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining me today. Well, this is it. This is the one I've dreaded since I even started this podcast. But, but you have got to stay tuned. I was, I was very pleasantly surprised, even, even amazed. And I think you will be too at what I was able to get out of this, <laughs> this infamous episode. So let's do it. Episode four of the first season of The Next Generation, <sighs> Code of Honor. The Enterprise is headed to a planet called Legon 2 to pick up a vaccine that's needed for a plague on Styrus 4. They'll need to sign a treaty to get their hands on the vaccine, so it's a full-on diplomatic mission. We're on a diplomatic mission! They've done their homework and feel confident in what they know about this culture and society. A highly structured society, and they're exceedingly proud. They beam the Ligonian delegation to the cargo bay that'll receive the vaccine. Lieutenant Yar has set up all the logistics. They arrive and, oh, okay, let's um, let's just talk about it right now. We're we're gonna learn a lot about this society as the episode goes on. There, in fact, there's even a scene that says the Ligonian culture mirrored the development of the uh, Chinese dynasties on Earth. But every single actor portraying a Ligonian is not only black, but also dressed in. <sighs> Sparkly, shiny versions of stereotypical, air quotes, African tribal garb, un air quotes. It's it's just uncomfortable just how blatantly they lean into racial stereotypes in this. I wanted to acknowledge this right up front, and I'm going to try not to bring it up again, at least not until I talk about what I thought about the episode. But this one single fact really really makes it difficult to watch through this episode. You are a racist and I don't like you. And I will not sell you this car. Okay, now that we've addressed that, let's get to the next super awesome thing about this episode. Ligonians also are weirdly super misogynist. They're shocked that Yar is in charge of security. A woman? Oh, and it gets better. So they go up to present a sample of the vaccine, assumedly to show good faith. Yar steps in to examine it. She says, you know, it's it's her duty. That makes sense. But the Ligonian pushes her off. Out of my way, woman. So she takes him to the ground using Aikido and even creates my eye after dropping him. Tensions are high, but Picard cuts through it. Would you do us the additional honor now of letting us entertain? They accept... And then we get a hint of what's to come. But the female may be exactly what I have needed. They host a social gathering in the observation lounge and Picard presents some gifts. Hey, this is the scene. This is the scene that the clapping Picard meme comes from. How cool is that? Well, we get yet another Awesome moment as Lutan, the head Ligonian, asks to check out the holodeck. He says he's heard that it's used to train Starfleet personnel, but Picard, <laughs> Picard totally outs Riker. We have heard how they are used to train your officers. And used for many other things too. Commander Riker, perhaps you and Counselor Troy would demonstrate. Whoa, dude, you gotta have number one's back. Yikes. Well, we learned that in Ligonian society, women own the land and they own all of the wealth, but men protect and rule it. It's an interesting approach that basically turns the women into commodities. Having a woman gives you access to her land and wealth, and that secures your status as a man. Wow, that was even uncomfortable just saying that, having a woman. (sighs) Well, Gives you some insight into this society. They agree to take Lutan to the holodeck where Yar demonstrates her Aikido training program. They do an admirable job, admirable, of trying to hide her stunt double. I mean, A for effort, but yeesh, no dice. 
She rolls the hologram masterfully and explains that it's adaptive. It will learn how to defeat you. The Lagonian that Yar took down, Hagon, gives it a try and is beaten by the hologram immediately. He's a diplomat, ultimately. He hides it well, but he is feeling great shame at this. They head back to the cargo bay to see the Lagonians off. And as they beam away, Lutan grabs Yar and kidnaps her. The cargo bridge, red alert. The Enterprise keeps trying to communicate with Legon 2, but, but they won't return their hails. On the bridge, Troy shares that she felt that all of the Lagonian men were attracted to Yar, but... With Lutan, I felt something else. Something more like avarice or ambition. And then Picard shines. Much, much like an angel coming down from heaven. A bright light in the darkness of this episode. He asks... Other comments? Other comments. Cadets, we... We have it. We have a leadership lesson. I knew it could be done. We'll, we'll talk about why those two simple words are so powerful when we get to the command codes. But ultimately, he leans on the crew's knowledge of the culture of the Lagonians, and then he decides to, to wait them out. Patience is highly valued in their society. After a full day of waiting, Dr. Crusher comes to update Picard. She heightens the urgency for the need for the vaccine. You've never had to watch a patient die from this disease. She's been trying to replicate the vaccine, but it can't, it can't be done. They must get it. They have no choice but to get it from the Lagonians. There's a quick moment here where Picard allows Wesley Crusher to hang out on the bridge. Let's him sit at ops. After that, oh my gosh, after that, we double down on uncomfortable racial commentary. For example, what Lutan did is similar to what certain American Indians once did called counting coup. Basically, what he's saying here is he thinks Lutan took Yar to increase his status in his society. Then, finally, the Lagonians return the Enterprise's calls. Troy, Riker, and Data all coach Picard on how to respond to Lutan given his culture's strict structures. He follows their advice and is invited down to the planet to retrieve Yar and then continue negotiations for the vaccine. Shockingly, we get to the planet's surface and, well, and actually it's, uh, it's Picard on the away team this time because of the diplomatic nature of the mission, by the way. But, but shockingly, Lutan changes the deal. I am altering the deal. Pray I don't alter it any further. And says Picard now has to ask for Yar in front of all of his guests at a special banquet. We meet Lutan's first one, Yarina, who appears to take a lot of pride in belonging to him. At the banquet that appears to have been shot on the same set as those original series episodes, you know, the ones with the red sky. Well, at the banquet, Picard makes the humble request, and Lutan denies it. He declares Yar to be his and to be his first one. Yarina freaks out and challenges the right of supersedence. Natasha Yar, I challenge you. A struggle to the death. Picard outright denies, and Lutan proclaims there will be no treaty, no vaccine, and no Lieutenant Yar. In her quarters on Legon 2, Picard and Troy meet with Yar, and, uh, and we double down now on the misogyny, too. And having him say he wants you Yes, of course, it made me feel good when he... Gross. There's a lot of talk about the Prime Directive, but nothing really specific. I'm guessing that in this case, it says that they can't just bust in there, take Yar, and transport away the vaccine. So they decide to help Yar prepare for the challenge. Picard, though, thinks this is all just super ridiculous, but he understands that the need for the vaccine is hypercritical. So to comply with the Prime Directive and to get the vaccine, well, Yar must fight. Jordy and Data are visiting on the Enterprise, and Data's trying out his comedy. Perhaps it is you, Jordy. including the Kiddleys, I've told 662 jokes, and you have not... <laughs> including the Kiddleys. Now, see, that's funny. It's a, it's a fun reprieve in this episode that is, that is desperately, desperately needed. This is, uh, this is one of the very first episodes, really, of the whole series, and they're already cashing in on the great chemistry between LeVar Burton and Brent Spiner. It's super, super fun. 
from here, there's a lot more scenes, a lot more dialogue, basically just people wringing their hands about the fight and talking about the prime directive. In fact, in all of the busy work scenes going on, it gives us a moment to reflect on what the prime directive means here in this episode. And I think that that's in Starfleet. The ends do not justify the means. How you do a thing matters, right? Well, more on that later. We learn that there's going to be some kind of, I don't know, jungle gym kind of thing constructed for Yar and Yurina to fight. Wait, Yar? Yarina? Oh my gosh, really? That's, I mean, that's like saying uh, Jeff has to fight Jefferson. I mean, wow, Yarina, that's the name. Okay, sorry, sorry. Um, okay, back on track. So they're going to build a structure. However, joined together, they would make a rectangle or square enclosing 121 square meters. If put end to end vertically, they would make a pole 44 meters high or two of 22. And we find out the weapons will be poisoned. This is really serious business. They bring in the weapons for the fight and offer three different sizes for Yar to choose from. They're basically, they're basically metal sock puppets with bird's beaks on them and, the, and spikes for the hairdo. Jordy confirms that they are absolutely slathered and covered in poison. We see Arena and the structure flailing around. <laughs> this, this, is, this is my favorite moment of the whole episode. There's just some random dude who walks up next to the little jungle gym thing. He lights this big, I don't know, sparkler and just stands there holding it. <laughs> it's awesome. I guess, I guess, I don't know, that's supposed to be all intimidating or something, but it's, it's just hilarious. I mean, even the music just drives it all home. Data, Riker, and Crusher meet quickly to discuss a plan that Picard and Yar have cooked up. This, this should be great. Well, it's time to get it on. Let's get it on! Yar has a tough guy headband on, and Yurina, well, well, um, I guess, I guess to be kind, I'll say the actor playing Yurina just, just isn't really a fighting in a jungle gym kind of person. Whew, this is, this is just awkward. In fact, in fact, watching this, it totally reminds me of watching backyard wrestling back in the late nineties. Huh? Anybody else? <laughs> yeah. It's oof, yikes. Well, then we get a pivotal scene to drive home the import of all of this as Yurina's weapon flips off of her hand and hits an audience member who crumples and dies immediately. <laughs> I mean, this is, this is awesome. Okay. Then, then we get my next favorite part here. I, I, I happened to pause the video here to take down a note. And right there, staring straight into the camera is Yar's stunt double. <laughs> this is just top notch on every count. Well, it's getting really tense, real serious. Hagon, Lutan's aide, stands up. Careful, you're reading. Hmm. I'm guessing there's something there we're going to hit on later. Well... As expected, the head of security of the flagship of the United Federation of Planets is victorious. She gacks Urena, falls on her, and then they're both beamed away. On the Enterprise, Crusher records that Urena has died and then takes her to sickbay. Hmm, looks like Picard and Yara's plan is unfolding. On the planet, Picard is trying to seal the deal and get away with the vaccine. Lutan is pushing to get Yar back, but Hagon reminds him. Remember, you have all Urena's wealth and lands in the Lutan chuckles at this, but then Riker beams up the vaccine and beams up Lutan and Hagon too. While Picard was on the planet up to his shenanigans, his plan came to fruition. Crusher revived Urena. They split some hairs. Urena professes her love to Hagon, and then he assumes Lutan's position of privilege. Hey, God, I heard you calling out for me. Joke's on you, Lutan. Starfleet gets the vaccine. Hagon gets the girl, and Lutan, well... I will have you as my number two. Take your place accordingly. Yeah, you tell him, Yurina. With all that unpleasantness done, Picard acknowledges Wesley Crusher's work at Ops and says that he's going to have the chance to do it again. Oh my goodness, is it over? Is it... Is it finally over, please? Please, just tell me it's finally over. Cut the quartz, quartz is fun. Come right now, don't walk, run! 
Hi there, cadets. In our last episode, where we watched Discovery's Choose Your Pain, we talked about the incredible performance review that Saru set up for himself. Well, I created a tool to help you do the same thing for yourself. For your free copy of this tool, visit jeffaken.com and join our mailing list. You'll get access to a copy that you can download for yourself and for your team. Just visit jeffaken.com and join the mailing list. Thanks. Where to start? Okay. Well, okay. Let's let's be honest here. There was there was some good in this, right? The Jordy and Data stuff was quick, but it was great. This exact interchange with the two of them and and Data trying to be funny lasts lasts all seven seasons, even even into the films. It's cool to see it this early on. Counselor Troy played a pretty active role in here, advising Picard on cultural nuances and, and being a resource for him. It was it was pretty cool and not necessarily the role that she's going to play throughout the entire series, unfortunately. And let's see what else. Well, yeah, there, there were a few endearing Picard moments, too, I suppose. We, uh, we got the Picard clapping meme. But ultimately, they're still kind of portraying him as kind of a stick in the mud, you know, like a, just a stodgy old man. But, oh, but it did have one of my all-time favorite Picard moments. I'm sorry. This is becoming a speech. You're the captain, sir. You're entitled. Hmm. Not entitled to ramble on about something everyone knows. Carry on. Right? If if only more people in leadership positions would think like this, I know it saved me a ton of time in meetings. Beyond that, though, just, just, just terrible. I mean, so bad. I, I want to share a few quotes from the cast on this one. Brent Spiner said, this was the worst episode they ever did. And he's thankful that it was so early on in the show's run. Jonathan Frakes called it a racist piece of Worf, who wasn't in this episode, is actually one of only two Next Generation episodes he wasn't in. But but Michael Dorn called this the worst episode of Star Trek ever filmed. It's hard to disagree with any of those thoughts. The worst episode ever. But in fairness, let's let's look at it a little differently. Or, I don't know, at least try to. See, this was the third or fourth episode, depending on how you count uh, Encounter at Farpoint of the brand new Star Trek. You know, a total departure from 20 years of Star Trek. We now look back on TNG as being such a great series and clearly part of the core canon of the franchise. But that was not the case at all in 1987. No, no, people wrote letters. They picketed. They would say, this isn't really Star Trek or not my Star Trek. (laughs) Sound familiar? Weird how history repeats itself, you think? Well, they were doing this weird thing where like, they were introducing a lot of new stuff, changing the look and the feel of the show, but, but still writing the same way, essentially, as they had been in the original series. Honestly, everything about this episode says it was meant to be a part of the original series. I mean, from the sets to the music to the plot itself. Like, just take everything about this episode and just just swap out Kirk for Yar and I don't know put a woman in place for Lutan and boom you've got a third season TOS episode easy so maybe maybe this is the result of the mixed direction and philosophy of the first few seasons of TNG or it's a piece of television garbage that should never ever be watched again either way this is it for Jeff Aiken I too have a code of honor, and it tells me to forget this one even exists. Command codes verified. Despite the atrocity that is this episode, we learned some really great things. I wasn't sure I'd be able to do it, but here we are. We're going to dive into the moment Picard engaged the bridge crew for their opinions. We're going to talk about what it looks like to be coachable, and we'll ask if the ends do indeed justify the means. The Starfleet Leadership Academy is supported by listeners just like you. Click the link in the show notes to support the ongoing production of this podcast. After Yar was abducted, Picard went straight into problem-solving mode. He put the ship on red alert and went right to work trying to get Yar back. The scene, the scene was just, just perfect. He knew he was up against something. He would need more 
brain power than just he could provide. So he engaged his team. He asked, Other comments? He knew others would have different ideas, different approaches to solving this problem. He never, he never tried to be the hero and just, you know, start spouting out orders to save the day. No, no. Instead, he actively and publicly asked for input. I think we can all agree that the job of a leader is not an easy one. One of the hardest things leaders often have to do is make a decision. And that's one of the reasons, honestly, that Star Trek is so great. We see leadership in crisis situations, decisions that sometimes have galactic impacts that have to be made in the blink of an eye. In this case, it's about rescuing a teammate while still being able to secure a critical life-saving vaccine. And here, Picard makes a decision, but, but he doesn't do it alone. What he does here is exactly what you and I should do every day as we're faced with decisions. Here, let me break it down step by step. Step by step. First off, he clearly defines the problem. Second, he identifies any constraints. Third, he asks for input. Fourth, he considers, weighs the input. And then fifth, he makes a decision. What's the problem? Yar has been abducted and must be rescued. What are the constraints? They need to do so in a way where they can still get the vaccine. He then actively, publicly asks for input and comments from the bridge crew. He hears them, considers it, and then decides to honor their culture and wait them out. In the Starfleet Leadership Academy episode, Elementary Dear Data, I asked you to define the things that happen in your workplace as being either critical, urgent, or routine. Critical being something you need to respond to immediately. Urgent being things you have, you know, on a few hours, maybe even a few days to respond to. And routine being, well, routine. This... This is a critical decision that Picard is making here. While the decision is to wait, it could have just as easily been to send a small strike team in to extract Yar or or pepper them with, with, with photon torpedoes. Either way, a decision was needed immediately, but but it had to be the right decision. So even in a critical situation like this, Picard took the time, literally, I mean, maybe 90 seconds, to engage with his team and ask for opinions. If Picard can take that moment, so can you. If Yen can cook, so can you. And look what it got him, right? (laughs) A special place in one of the worst hours of television Star Trek has ever offered. But, But here's what's great. That's not all. Picard also demonstrates another incredible quality. He, Captain Jean Luc Picard, is coachable. Wow. That's a word we use a lot these days, isn't it? Coaching. I've heard it said over and over again, and, and you likely have too, that, that now, nowadays, managers are, are coaches. I'm not a teacher. I'm the new basketball coach. No, I, I totally, I totally agree with that. And I find that to be a powerful paradigm shift, but we almost never talk about the other side to that. And that's being coachable. To help define what coachable is, I'm going to give an example of what coachable isn't. And that is my daughter. At the time of this recording, she's just finished kindergarten and we've enrolled her in activities through the summer, you know, as you do. She spent a week in a soccer camp. It was great. Kids her age, just a little older, you know, working with a local high school coach that has a few championships under their belt. So I drop her off on the first day and immediately, She's playing with the other kids, not shying away from the ball or the field at all. It's, it's perfect. So I pick her up a few hours later and I, I ask her how it went. She says they worked on juggling. That's cool. I mean, straight out of the beach scene in Karate Kid. That's, that's what I'm thinking. So I ask, her, I ask her, how many times was she able to juggle the ball? She tells me that she didn't juggle at all. So why not? I ask. <laughs> she says, Because I already know how. (laughs) She already knows how. 
Yeah. Um, full disclosure here, this is probably the fourth time in her whole life she's even seen a soccer ball, let alone juggled. But yeah, but she already knows how, right? So camp goes on for four more days and she had a great time. She made some friends, you know, got super dirty from rolling around on the field and stuff. Is, is she going to be playing soccer once school starts though? Like, is this her new path? <laughs> no, no. Even after all that, <laughs> I'm still not convinced she can even kick the ball, let alone play with the team or anything like that. Now, is that because she's lazy or defiant or, and here's a, here's a management word for you, insubordinate? No, of course not. It's, it's because she's not coachable. She already knows it and isn't going to listen to anyone else that can help her do better. So if that's being not coachable, and, and I can imagine you all have someone in mind from your life that fits that description, right? And I am 100% certain you can think of at least one person at work that fits that too. But if, if that's not coachable, what is coachable? What does that look like? Well, Picard shows us here and beautifully. He has ideas on how he wants to approach all of this. I mean, he wants to get into Lutan's face, threaten him with the might of the Enterprise. But he's got Troy with him. Troy explains the cultural nuances of the Lugonians and suggests behaviors and approaches to Picard. And he does what she suggests. And that's it, right there. That's what being coachable looks like. She said he should do a thing based on a real reason that she explained, and then he did that thing. It was perfect. So if you want to influence someone to be more coachable, you need to model what that looks like. You need to run ideas by someone, hear their advice, and follow it. Now, of course, I am not saying you should blindly just, just follow what somebody says, but, but follow the Picard-Troy model here. They've built a trusting relationship based very much on their professional expertise at this point, this early in the series. And Troy, as the coach, provides context to her coaching. She doesn't just tell Picard what to do. She gives the background. She gives the cultural context so Picard understands the coaching and can apply a level of critical decision making to decide if he's going to follow it or not. Now, here's what I want you to take from this discussion here, and that is that you need a coach. We all need a coach. When people describe Picard's leadership qualities, diplomacy always comes up. But here, had he gone in there without a coach, he would have escalated the conflict and likely not gotten the vaccine. Now, if Picard needs a Troy while operating in his area of expertise, you do too. Or... To use a super obscure reference, almost none of you will get, but I'll be super excited that I was able to fit this in. <laughs> if a Peart needs a Gruber, you need a coach. Hmm. Be where you're at, because if you're not where you're at, it begs the question, where are you? The last thing I want to talk about is the use of the Prime Directive in this episode. The Prime Directive was established back in the original series and basically says that Starfleet will not interfere in the development of less advanced cultures. Now, I'm not, I'm not so sure how that fits into the context of this episode, given the technology that we see from the Lagonians. But what, but what they're saying, not the word Prime Directive, but what they mean by it is, is very important. As I hear it, they're using the Prime Directive to define the values and principles of the Federation. There's an easy way to solve their problems in this episode, right? Lock onto the vaccines and yar, beam them up, warp away. But those actions are in direct opposition to the values of the Federation. They see themselves as partners, not as conquerors, not as, well, not as bullies. For me, this really emphasized the age old question. Do the ends justify the means or does the end result justify the actions you took to get there? There's a cool sci-fi show that ran a while ago called the hundred, the 100, the hundred, I don't know, the one zero zero and spoilers ahead if you haven't seen this yet, but there's an AI named Allie that is programmed to make life better for humankind. 
she determined that the problem, <laughs> the problem is that there are too many humans. So to make life better, <laughs> she was going to kill most people. She's hacking nuclear launch codes. Why? Too many people. Now, the end result could have been great, right? Abundant resources, a cleaner environment, the eradication of poverty and hunger and all, all kinds of great stuff. But is killing millions or even billions to achieve that okay? Like, do we forgive all the death because the world's problems are supposedly solved now? Picard could have easily snagged the vaccine in Yar and ran, but, but then what does that do for the Ligonians? Is there a fair value exchange for the vaccine? Or did Starfleet just plant a seed for a future enemy because of how they disrespected their culture? In this episode, Picard insists on doing things in a way that conform with Lagonian society, and he holds himself and his crew to a high standard to act with professionalism and respect. Does this make it harder for him to achieve his goals? Yeah. Is he taking a risk of possibly losing it all? Yeah, absolutely. But he sticks to the values of his organization and leans on the skills and expertise of his team to not only get all of the things they need, but, but also to stick it to the dirty player in a way that respects Ligonian culture. We see another great example of this in the classic Saved by the Bell episode, Jesse's Song. You remember this one, right? That's where Jesse Spano takes caffeine pills to give herself an edge in her studies, wanting to get higher grades. Right, I gotta wash my hair. No, there's no time. No time. There's never any time. I don't have time to study. I'll never get into Stanford. For her, for Picard, the ends do not and did not justify the means. Now, I want to be fair. There are those that feel the ends do indeed justify the means. Machiavelli supported it in The Prince. Sergei Necheyev, not the Admiral Necheyev, who we'll meet in future TNG episodes, but Sergei Necheyev also said the ends justify the means. He was a Russian communist revolutionary in the late 1800s. He was an avowed supporter of what he called revolutionary terror, or what we call terrorism, to the point that Dostoevsky based a character in his book Demons on him. So being fair, yeah, there are people who feel differently than Picard demonstrates in this episode, but I'm going to let you decide who you'd rather model yourself after. We did it. We got through one of, if not the worst episode in all of Star Trek. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming along on this journey with me. Now I've got some listener shout outs. Thanks to the following awesome listeners for leaving a review and sharing it with me. A Coach Cam, G Long, and Misser at PDX. I really appreciate the feedback and the reviews. Keep them coming. Reach out. Let me know what you thought of this one. I'm on Twitter at SFLA podcast and on all the social media at Jeff T Aiken. That's Jeff T as in terrible, awful episode, A-K-I-N. And check out the Starfleet Leadership Academy podcast group on Facebook. The link is in the show notes and you are really missing out on some great interactions if you haven't joined. Computer, what are we going to watch next time? The original series, second season, episode 16, A Private Little War. I think this one is most remembered as the one with the big white ape with a horn sticking out of its head, but it's also another commentary on the Vietnam War. And a quick update on episodes. I've explained in the past that I've programmed the computer with all the possible Star Trek episodes to watch and learn from. Well, I've, I've been on the fence about including Lower Decks on that list. On my first watch through, it really struck me as being more comedic and just a, you know, a, a fun version of Star Trek. A Trek, a Trek that knows all the same in-jokes, you know, that we do. But on my rewatches, I found some really, really great lessons. It'll be perfect 
for this podcast. So I've plugged lower decks in. The way it's gonna work is the first time computer comes up with a lower decks episode, regardless of which one, we'll watch Second Contact. That's the, the first episode. That's what we did for all the other series. From there, we'll just take the random episodes as they come up. I am really looking forward to watching those and sharing my takeaways. But until then, Ex Astra Scientia. Ex Astra Scientia.